Last year, on Rosh Hashanah, I delivered a drash at Eitz Chaim entitled, Reflecting Israel in Me. I had spent much of the year joining with the Israeli community here in Israel, here in Melbourne and in Israel with the World Union for Progressive Judaism Conference, loudly protesting the actions of the Israeli government on the issue of judicial reforms. I felt and still feel strongly that these issues transcend politics and speak to the core of our Jewish values and identity. I joined my voice to so many Israelis and Jews around the world in defense of our Jewish state, fighting for a Jewish homeland that adheres to our Jewish and democratic ideals on which the state of Israel was founded. Little did I know that four weeks later, the heart of our Jewish people would be shattered and the core of our Jewish identity challenged on the international stage pushing everything else aside. And so for the past year, I, like most of us, have joined my voice to that of so many Israelis and Jews around the world, again, in defense of our Jewish state. This time, fighting for Israel's right to exist and defend herself against her enemies. This time, fighting for the Jewish people in Australia and in every nation where Jews reside to be seen, heard and valued as equal citizens in their lands. Many people struggle to understand the integral connection between Israel and the Jewish people. For me, Israel is a part of the fabric of my being, integral to my Jewish identity. For me and many Jews, Israel is the heart of the Jewish people, our center, the place that beats with our past, our present and future, providing the creativity and inspiration that flows through our veins and gives life to our souls. I've also learned that what happens in Israel, for better or for worse, reflects the way people everywhere see and perceive Jews. I hear stories from my family, friends, and our Jewish community here and around the world of Jews losing their jobs, being canceled, being excluded from their social circles, being verbally, verbally harassed and sometimes physically assaulted on the street, being targeted in their homes, their workplaces, and synagogues for being Jewish, distorting the word Zionism and Zionist into a bad word, using Israel as a pretext or scapegoat to unleash their latent, misinformed, and naked anti-Semitism. I debated if or when during the Yamim Noraim, the High Holy Days, I should raise this issue, but I found myself unable to think about anything else right now. Perhaps it's because of the proximity to October 7th, one year later, and the hostages have not been released, and the war rages on, expanding even as we speak. Perhaps it's because I know of people who have been killed and are still missing. Perhaps it's because I have children on university campuses in Australia and have friends with children in American universities who are struggling to feel safe, seen, and heard on their terms. Perhaps it's because of the escalation of the violence with Hezbollah and the incoming retribution for the assassination of Nasrallah the leader of Iranian-backed terrorist organization, responsible for three and a half decades of carefully planned terrorist attacks in Israel, the United States, Europe, Southeast Asia, and on his own people in Lebanon. And perhaps because here in Australia, citizens marched with pictures of Nasrallah and the Hezbollah flag, mourning the loss of a terrorist, turning our concept of morality upside down. I did, however, appreciate the irony of Hamas's statement after the confirmation of Nasrallah's death. We condemn in the strongest terms this barbaric Zionist aggression, and we consider it a cowardly terrorist act. That's the definition of chutzpah. Perhaps I'm struggling to think of anything else because I feel that so much of the international communities continued response either criticizes Israel for escalating the conflict or feebly attempts to remain neutral. 
I am deeply frustrated and angered by the overt bias condemning Israel's actions and their consequences on the people of Gaza and Lebanon with little to no recognition of the ongoing relentless attacks by Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, and now Iran, and its continued impact on Israeli civilians. Time will only tell now what happens with Iran's involvement. Furthermore, albeit incredibly distressing, the biased and disproportionate emphasis on the devastation, displacement, and life of li lo loss of life in Gaza and Lebanon without acknowledging the devastation, displacement, and loss of life in Israel is equally troubling. I did, however, appreciate the U.S. President's reiterated support for Israel's right to defend herself and calling Israel's assassination of Nasrallah a measure of justice for his countless victims during his reign of terror while still pushing for a diplomatic solution that will see both a ceasefire and a return of the hostages. Acknowledging the impact of this war on Israel and Israeli citizens does not discount our compassion for the devastating impact on the innocent civilians in Gaza and Lebanon. However, not acknowledging or belittling the impact on Israel and Israelis creates the impression that Israeli lives are devalued, do not matter, are irrelevant. This fuels anti-Semitic statements and actions worldwide, for it perpetuates the dehumanization of Jewish life and justifies immoral behavior that would be condemned in any other context. So, all of the regular mess messaging for this high holiday season has been dimmed for me as I felt an overwhelming sense of sadness, anger, and helplessness. I struggled to find words of insight, self-reflection, and inspiration befitting of the new year. When looking at the year ahead, I struggled to see a light at the end of the tunnel. So, not the inspirational and uplifting Rosh Hashanah sermon I had hoped to deliver at my first high holiday season with TBI, but stick with me until the end. In Jewish mysticism, there is a Kabbalistic map, the Sfirot, like a blueprint of the divine qualities that guide our understanding of how God interacts with the world. The two central Sfirot, or spheres, Gvura and Chesed, sit opposite each other, creating a sense of balance. Gv Actually, Gvura is on this side. Gvura and Din reflect the need for strength, judgment, justice, security, and accountability, ensuring that actions have consequences and that fairness governs the world. Without Gvura, chaos would reign and rules would become meaningless. Chesed or Rachamim reflect the need for kindness, compassion, mercy, empathy, and unconditional love. It is the principle that opens the heart and transcends just judgment, providing a willingness to forgive and move forward. A world with only chesed would lack structure and direction, as boundless compassion would lead to a lack of accountability. Our tradition teaches us to seek the balance between gvura and chesed, between strength and kindness, between din and rachamim, between judgment and compassion, for we cannot have one without the other. The Midrash teaches of a king who had empty glasses. The king said, if I put hot water in them, they will expand and break. If I put cold water in them, they will contract and shatter. What did the king do? He mixed hot water with cold water and put them in the glasses. So too does the Holy One of Blessings say, if I create the world with the attribute of compassion alone, no one would be concerned with the consequences of their actions. With the attribute of judgment alone, how could the world stand? Rather, I behold, rather behold I create both with the attribute of judgment and the attribute of compassion, and hopefully it will stand. During these Yamim Noraim, these days of awe, our goal is to find that balance, the balance between judgment and compassion. In order to find that balance, tension must exist, 
holding up and ensuring that balance. It is no coincidence that the symbol for the Hebrew month of Tishrei, the month of my high holidays, is moznaim, or scales, representing balance. During the Yamim Noraim, we stand before God in judgment. Our liturgy reminds us that we are being evaluated and held accountable for our actions over the past year. Yet, in front of the open ark, we recite Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum Vechanun. We recite the 13 divine attributes of mercy, calling on God to acknowledge our pain and shortcomings with kindness, patience, and the capacity to forgive. Avinu Malkenu, our parent, our leader, our judge, our shepherd, this duality teaches us that even as we seek justice, we must also leave room for compassion. Within Israel now, there is a tension between justice and compassion. Right now, Israel is a country divided between those whose highest priority is that of returning the hostages, valuing the sanctity of human life above all else with a focus on compassion, and those whose highest priority is that of Israel's long-term security, valuing the right of Israeli citizens to feel secure within their borders above all else with a focus on judgment and justice. Israel is a country divided between those calling out political corruption, abuse of power, and governmental self-interest above that of the nation, citing an absence of kindness and compassion. And those fighting for a stronger Israel, a stronger Jewish religious practice and defense, citing an absence of strength, judgment, and justice. I feel that the international community have expressed compassion for the innocent Palestinians and Lebanese victims of this conflict, those who were killed, used as human shields, injured, displaced, and traumatized. Yet many struggle to show compassion for the innocent Israeli victims of this conflict, the murdered, the injured, the hostages, the displaced, and the traumatized. I feel that many in the international community seek judgment and justice for what they call Israeli aggression, for what they call a vengeful and disproportionate response claiming what, for war crimes, claiming that Israel's actions are genocidal and that Israel illegally occupies what they purport to be Palestinian land, despite the fact that Jews have been living alongside Arabs on that land for thousands of years. Despite the fact that Israel was granted the land by the British and was declared a state 76 years ago. Despite the fact that Israel was recognized as a full member nation state by the United Nations 75 years ago. Despite the fact that Israel has never claimed a desire or intent to annihilate the Palestinian or Lebanese people, but rather Israel's stated objective is to eradicate the leadership of terrorist organizations, first Hamas and now Hezbollah, who continue to indiscriminately target civilians. Yet I feel that the international community struggle to seek judgment and justice for the leadership of Hamas, for their violent aggression against women, men, children, the elderly, for their war crimes, taking hostages, murdering and intentionally targeted civilians, for their written and verbal statements calling for the annihilation of Israel and the Jews, as stated in the Hamas Charter. Israel will exist and continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it obliterated others before it. The day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees will cry out, O oh Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. I feel that the many in the international community struggle to acknowledge or condemn Hezbollah or the Houthis for their ongoing assault on Israel that, were it not for Israel's defensive Iron Dome, would have killed hundreds of thousands of Israeli, Israelis, obliterated homes, schools, hospitals, businesses, and farmlands. In other words, I feel like Israel is being condemned for its effective defense system and protecting its citizens. 
I feel that our universities and city centers claim to seek compassion for Palestinians, advocating for Palestinian independence while chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, and 2468, we don't want your Jewish state, while falsely accusing Israel of genocide. I feel that their emphasis is on vengeance and hatred of Israel rather than on compassion and practical support for the Palestinian people, recognizing their need for self-determination. The consequence of this imbalance is dire. Israel has become an international outcast with significant political and economic consequences, experiencing physical and emotional isolation and significant increase in reported presentations of PTSD, chronic stress, anxiety, and depression. Since October 7th, 2023, there has been a 285% increase in Israelis who have left the country compared to this time last year. Over 200,000 Israelis in the South were displaced just after the attacks last year, and more than 60,000 Israelis in the North are still currently displaced due to ongoing rocket and drone attacks with Hezbollah, having threatened to displace hundreds of thousands of more. And now, with Iran officially entering the playing field, the threat to Israel has exponentially increased. Likewise, the consequence for Gaza and Lebanon is dire. Some in our community don't care, and they say, well, they get what's coming to them. For them, it's about judgment and justice. But where's the balance? Where's our compassion for the innocent? Our Jewish tradition teaches us not to judge the innocent along with the guilty, acknowledging that an enormous number of innocent Palestinians and Lebanese are being harmed, killed, and displaced by the prolonged conflict, regardless of who we feel is responsible. This reminds us of our humanity and is inherent in our Jewish teachings. To lack compassion for innocent suffering is antithetical to Jewish values, which command us to not stand idly by the blood of our neighbor. The Talmud teaches us whoever destroys a life, it is as if they can destroy an entire world. And whoever saves the life, it is as if they consider, uh, saved an entire world. When we feel hurt and angry, when the international stage devalues Israeli and Jewish lives and is intentionally blind to our loss of life, displacement and suffering, how can we ignore the loss of innocent life and suffering of the innocent Palestinians and Lebanese? After all, the well-known rabbinic sage Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to others. That is the whole Torah. All the rest is commentary. In Pirkei Avot, we are told, in a place where there are no mention, you be the mensch. So just because others are not expressing compassion for Israeli lives and suffering, doesn't mean that we should stop doing the right thing, being mentioned and show compassion. Our tradition implores us to sit with the tension between judgment and compassion, between justice and mercy, and seek the balance. This morning's Torah reading is not the one we normally read. It is traditional in other communities. We read the story of the banishment of Hagar and Ishmael, this story challenges our understanding of moral behavior and forces us to look critically at the implication of our choices, our ability to empathize, and the difficulty of finding balance between judgment and compassion. For those of you who zoned out during the Torah reading and are zoning out during my Parsha, if you didn't zone out, you can zone out now, but then come back in at the end. Short brief, remember what happened. Sarah was infertile. So she suggested that her servant Hagar bear a child with her husband Abraham, as you do. According to Midrash, Hagar mocked Sarah for her infertility, implying that Sarah was inferior due to her, her inability to conceive, a key measure of a woman's worth during biblical times. Possibly driven by jealousy, insecurity, or spite, the Torah tells us that Sarah treated Hagar harshly. Thirteen years later, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, who was destined to continue the covenant with God. 
Sarah demanded that Abraham banish Hagar and her son Ishmael from their household. Abraham, torn by the situation, sought guidance from God, who instructed him to listen to his wife, smart God. Torn between feeling compassion for Hagar, Ishmael, and Sarah, and enacting judgment on Hagar for her ridicule of Sarah, reluctantly, Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael into the wilderness. Hagar wept, and God, hearing her cries, promised that Ishmael would become the father of a great nation, the Arabs, showing both judgment and compassion for Hagar and Ishmael. Sarah and Hagar saw each other as threats, as enemies, and were unable to help each other figure out how to coexist peacefully. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs reminded us that your enemy is also a human being. Hostility may divide you, but there is something deeper that connects you, the covenant of human solidarity. Pain, distress, difficulty, these things transcend the language of difference. A decent society is one in which enemies do not allow their rancor or animosity to prevent them to coming into one another's assistance when they need help. Rabbi Sachs posited that the Talmudic imperative to help your enemy can help us overcome feelings of distance, anger, or hatred, helping to relieve a psychological burden. As it says in the Torah, Lo tisna et achicha bilvavecha, you shall not hate the brother in your heart. Hang in with me for those of you that may be falling asleep. Nowhere in the Torah does it say to hate your enemy. Rabbi Sachs points out to the contrary. Moses commands, do not hate an Edomite because he is your brother. Do not hate an Egyptian for you were strangers in their land. These were the paradigm cases of enemies. Edom was Esau, Jacob's rival. The Egyptians were the people who enslaved the Israelites, yet Moses commands that it is forbidden to hate them. In fact, the Mishnah teaches that hatred will drive a person out of this world. According to Rabbi David Rosenfeld, hatred will make a person's life miserable and impede one's ability to enjoy their life's blessings. We, may, we must take heed not to allow hatred or anger to consume, consume us. For the Torah also teaches, Lotikom velotitor, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge. Maimonides claimed that holding on to anger leads to vengeance. Therefore, we are commanded not to bear a grudge, so that the impression of the wrong should completely be obliterated and no longer remembered. He said, this is the right principle. It alone makes civilized life and social interaction possible. Almost there. Rabbi Jack Abramovitz from Jew in the City said, the purpose of the mitzvah to help our enemy is to cultivate the trait of compassion within us. The Torah wants us to take the high road, which makes us better people. We have the power to choose whether our words will turn away with wrath or stir up anger. We can try to engage others wisely, or we can escalate the situation foolishly. We can try to mend fences and reach a meeting of the minds, or we can antagonize one another into being enemies. But in a world where there are so many already against us just for existing, why would anyone want to make an enemy out of a potential friend? So, as we enter the Amim Noraim, our high holy days, and wrestle with feelings of anger, resentment, and sadness about the situation in Israel, Gaza, Lebanon, and here in Australia, let us strive for a balanced perspective, one that embraces gvura and din, strength, judgment, and accountability, while also holding chesed and rachamim, kindness, compassion, and empathy for innocent people who are suffering. As we embark on our introspective journeys, let us likewise strive for the balance between judgment and compassion, accountability and kindness towards ourselves and others. Wishing you all a well-balanced high holiday season. Shana Tovah.